being in a relationship and trying to justify an £8,900 DAC might be worthy of a Netflix series because I'm pretty sure you would get beaten to death with a kitchen wooden spoon. Be that as it may, you've managed to hoodwink uh, your partner and you've actually got one of these in your house. The flagship DAC from Cord, a British company residing here in the UK, obviously. Shall we discuss? Because there's quite a lot to talk about. First and foremost, a massive thank you to Jez. Thank you for sending the Dave in for review. Thank you for sending the Mscaler in for review. It's greatly appreciated, mate. And it's because of viewers like Jez that the channel gets to review these high-end products to bring you a comprehensive and a deep analysis and comparisons up against some of the best in the industry. So like I stated, this is a prohibitively expensive DAC. If you can afford it, you know who you are. If you can't afford it, grab some popcorn, make a tea, make a coffee, sit back and let me tell you what this can do. Taking a hardware tour around this unit, this unit is actually pretty compact compared to this behind me, the Hollow Audio May KTE. That is a dual stacked system with a separate power supply that is absolutely massive. So let's take a quick hardware tour. On the front of the device, we have a 6.3 jack. This is single-ended. All cord products are single-ended through and through. It's quite powerful, the amplifier in this unit. It can output six VRMS at 33 ohms and similarly at 300 ohms. This unit can drive 800 ohm headphones. I've still not come across one of those. If you have, put it down in the comment section. I wanna know about it. We have this humongous round portal screen with a square display underneath. 2001 Space Odyssey. I just hope Hal isn't in here. Uh, he might be because some of the magic from this unit is quite remarkable. Uh, this is their coral line, I believe. And then we have um, four buttons surrounding this volume knob. Very nice feeling, very clicky. This rolling knob functions as mute and obviously the volume control. Surrounding it, these balls actually slide around. It's really weird feeling. Uh, we have the up and down for the menus and left and right to select. Pretty straightforward. Spinning the unit around. This unit is a 34 centimeters by 15 by seven centimeters weighing at five kilograms. It's quite a hefty little beast. Look, I mean, quite portable though. I mean, if you plan to go to a hotel or something or a long vacation, you can actually take this with you, you know. Um, I don't think it's that difficult compared to that may behind me. This is absolutely remarkable for the performance you get. We've got a power supply, obviously with a uh, cutoff switch. It's a switch mode power supply and it's got good filtering inside as well. Uh, four BNC connections. This is for a future product from Cord. Um, outputting four times the digital resolution or something. Uh, it says it in the manual. It said it the same thing for the TT2, but I've not seen that product be released yet. Two BNC extra inputs. We have a pair of optical SPDIF, uh, AES, and this is where the magic happens. A pair of BNC connections, just like these two, except that these can be used in dual data mode with the M scaler for upsampling. We will get onto that later. A galvanically isolated USB-B connection, single-ended RCA, mounting the balanced XLRs. As far as I'm aware, these are definitely not balanced because this unit's single-ended through and through, so it's just for convenience. Uh, Cord doesn't do balanced products. But why could they couldn't do a 4.4 balance on the Mojo 2? If they can do it here and on the TT2, only they know. Because for convenience sake, it's very important. So that's the unit. Very simple, very straightforward. The weirdest design I have ever seen. I absolutely love the TT2, but this unit uh, leaves a little bit to be desired, to be honest with you. Hopefully with the second generation, it might be a different design because what we have to appreciate is this unit was released in 2015. It's seven years old. And even now it's the equivalent and in some areas better than a ladder DAC from Hollow Audio, the May KTE, in some areas, and it's only by 1%, because um, 
There will be comparisons, don't worry. And we get this cheap plasticky $1.99 remote from China with this 9,000 pound DAC. It's absolutely mind boggling. Why isn't it solid block of aluminium like this? I don't get it. Let me show you the Holo Audio May remote. Machine out of a block of aluminium. You can actually use this as a deadly weapon. I'm gonna keep it on here on just so that you guys can appreciate. It's the same material as this, solid. If you throw this at someone, I think you'll kill them. Anyway, we get these correlating four buttons with this here to do the volume inputs, which is pretty handy. A mute button on the top right here, uh, cross feed here and power on and off there. Very useful actually if you're using this unit at long distances from your listening chair. Let's talk about some of the software and specifications of this unit. Like I stated, on the front we have the 6.3 jack. This can output 6 VRMS at 33 and at 300 ohms, which is great, that's fine. Uh, the USB can output 768 kilohertz at 32 bit. DSD from 64 to 512. The BNC connections, if you use in dual data form with the uh, M scaler, you can input 768 kilohertz. Basically, that's what we get in upsampling mode or 384 on a singular basis. AES supports 96 at 24, I believe. Uh, optical 44 to 96 at 24 bit. And similarly for these two as well. Remember, this is a pre as well. So when in pre mode, you do that by holding the side buttons together. You can't access it through the menus, uh, which I found to my chagrin. It took me two days to find that out, which was very irritating. Uh, 19 volts, I believe, and attenuation of 19 dB volume availability. So be careful when buggering about with this volume knob here. Do not let your kids go yoink when it's connected to your power speakers and your power amp because you probably blow the house up. Uh, so. That's the hardware specifications. The cord products, as a rule, use FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. And the machine programming and the mathematical programming is Rob Watts' genius for the cord line of products. Because FPGA can be used for a variety of different implementations, such as network cards, etc. So it's not just for audio but the mathematical genius and the programming is what's important and Cord is the best at it. So the Dave is the culmination of all of their knowledge and testing and this is the baby of Rob Watts. This is a Delta Sigma DAC, akin to the signature behind me, DAC3B back there, etc. So that means oversampling, no NOS mode on this unit. So when comparing to other devices such as the May, we have to put it on a leveling field. The strength of cord products is this upsampling ability, the tap count. All Delta Sigma DACs upsample, it's their nature. And their tap count usually rolls off around 100 to 1000 to 2000 if you're lucky taps. The cheapest line of the cord products, the Mojo 2, has I believe 41,000 taps. And the core Dave has 164,000 taps. With the assistance of the M scaler, that brings the tap count to over a million. It's absolutely insane the computing power this unit has and the fact that it was released in 2015. So, software on the Dave is very simple. You press up, you get DSD or PCM filters, you get polarity, you get a high frequency filter and then you get display. The display has four modes. There's color, there's white, there's black and white, I believe, and there is a black one that switches off very, very quickly, which is very irritating for OCR. Every time I try and read the screen, I keep having to press meh, meh, meh to uh, see what the hell it's saying. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit irritating, but I haven't found any place within this unit where you can uh, leave that so that it actually stays on for a little bit longer. It would be a bit more useful in my situation. 
Jump in between pre and direct DAC out is very simple. You hold the left and right buttons, but it's not in the menu. So you have to remember that. And you have to remember what the situation is. But I don't think you need to remember whether it's on pre or direct DAC mode because I think it pops up on the screen. So coupled with the FPGA, we have Rob Watts WTA filter and using their pulse array technology to bring everything together. I will link three articles below where Rob Watts goes into depth about the pulse array, about the FPGA and about the WTA aspects of the Dave and their other DACs. It's extremely technical and it's beyond my pay grade to actually break down properly. But what isn't above my pay grade is why you're here. The sonic characteristics and the performance of the Dave. So on that note, let's discuss. For the sake of transparency, the DAVE has been used as a standalone unit by itself using its internal amp. It has been used with the Holo Audio Serene Pre as a headphone amp, a new iteration to the channel, with a benchmark AHP2, with a firm or stack, and most importantly, with my Genelec and studio monitors, the Mackies behind me. A very large variety of testing. And this DAC has not been tested in its own echo chamber by itself. We have the Make ATE here, we have the Hugo TT2 here, we have the DAC3B here, and we have the IFI signature here. There will be individual reviews for all of these DACs coming. And not only that, there will be a shootout, the CMA way, coming as well. The reason why I am not going to talk about the M scaler much in this review is because that's going to require its own dedicated review for all of these DACs when we discuss upsampling, whether to go for the M scaler or for HQ player, depending on your needs. And that video is going to be comprehensive enough by itself to actually integrate into this review. But the quick and short summary of it is, the M scaler enhances the Dave incredibly well. In fact, if you are buying the Dave, you should either contemplate the M scaler or HQ player at the least. Double helix interconnects were used. The Chakron, I think it's level three, his highest quality cables in the system build. The pre using the Dave's own pre and the hollow audio. The amplifiers, the OR, the AHP2, the Serene, the Mackies and the Genelec, plus its own internal one. A vast array of equipment. So how does this DAC perform? Costing 9,000 pounds. It's an absolutely incredible DAC. It's so good, it's difficult to go back. To give you a summary, before we break down the way we do on this channel, the frequency response and how it correlates and presents itself characteristic by characteristic. Let me paint you a picture. Hal, open the airlock. I would like to take a walk outside. The characteristics of this DAC resembles Closing your eyes, stepping out of an airlock of a ship in the vacuum of space. In this area of the galaxy we're looking at, there are no stars visible. It's a black void, like a hollow nothingness. The background of the Dave is so black, I've only come across one other DAC that performs like this and not even a quarter of the level of the blackness this has. And that's the low two gold touch portable DAP. The May has a black background. The Dave has a void. Pairing this with dark sounding headphones is like you're falling into nothingness. It's absolutely mesmerizing to behold. So, with some inertia from the ship, you find 
the cord that's tying you to it gives you a little tug and you are spun around in space. You are still beholding the vacuum of space. But now you can see the cosmos. Every single remote star is lit up with no pollution, obviously. You can behold the colours, the shapes that the galaxies and stars are creating. And this is the instruments within this stage. It's extraordinarily spacious. So much so, it can actually outperform closed headphones that have a small stage and widen the field, such as the LCD5 behind me. The combination of the Dave, the Serene, the Awe, and the LCD5 was one of the best chains I have ever heard. Absolutely stunning. Cord separation within their DAX is legendary, and the Dave does not disappoint. You find every instrument is very well separated. The edge of attack is wonderful, but the vastness of the stage, especially for music like choirs or orchestra, really takes advantage of this width and depth. It's absolutely insane. Also, it's a very quick DAC. For EDM, etc., it's extremely responsive. And what's so incredible about it, it is such a high-performing DAC. Even the most complicated tracks, such as the Hans Zimmer's Pirates of the Caribbean 50 orchestra piece live, is rendered beautifully as if it's actually live. It does not convolute the treble region of the track. Spatial presentation within the stage is very good. Here we find Rob Watts' attitude towards the tap count, the edge of transience, and the response is very apparent. The edge of attack is absolutely ridiculous on this DAC. The attack of instruments, it hits very, very, very hard. Very hard very well controlled. So with that, let's break down the frequency response. Everything I have mentioned right now correlates to this unit as a standalone unit by itself, not with other amplifiers yet. Bass region is extremely quick, extremely hard hitting, Separation texture is wonderful, but I find it's a little bit lean. When you go to the May, you find it has a bit more body. It's a little bit more swollen and a little bit more viscerally large. But on the Dave, it's a little bit more lean. It's the difference of a planar, an extraordinarily good planar headphone in the sub bass category versus an extraordinarily good dynamic headphone in the sub bass category. It's really weird how this correlates very well to these DACs, that kind of comparison, but is that, that is the response you get. But within the stage, the sub bass is easily identifiable and the black void surrounds this sub bass right here and it's not that it's dead between instruments it's that it reflects the characteristics of the instruments within the surrounding field or environment or placement it's set in so for example an orchestra hall or a small stage or a studio environment it's very very apparent transparency and resolution is ultra high on this unit ultra high I think it might even edge out the May KT a little bit for resolution, but a very tiny amount. Mid bass attack is really hard, really, really hard. You never feel as though it softens no matter what track you throw at it, even uh, by test tracks, for example. Infected Mushrooms Back to the Source of, or Converting Vegetarian albums, they are 
both very well presented here and especially with that huge stage and layering and separation you get every element of the synth that's been overlaid each other one on top of each other one on top of each other so that nothing gets convoluted the resolution is so ridiculously high in every part of the frequency response and this goes from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz very very beautifully the tonal balance is very beautiful there's nothing ever out of whack everything is a linear rise i can't tell you if it's got a sharp treble or a boosted mid-range no it's just smooth Mid-range instruments, vocals, are extraordinarily well presented. But there is a tiny caveat. I find, unlike the May KTE behind me, the stage is ultra-large, so it's extremely good for orchestra and live music. But for general tracks, it can't come forward the way the May does in the track. It can't collapse the track so it's ultra intimate. Everything, like the HD800S, feels as though it's close yet remote. But with beautiful separation and distinction between each element of the sound. So in this category, I would definitely give it to the May over this. But for vastness, if you want an open stage for music, holy hell, this is absolutely mind-boggling good. Resolution, detail, and transparency, and informational retrieval is absolutely incredible on the treble region. I have never found anything where I've gone, okay, that is a little bit too much. For example, like the Soundcast SGDD1, a $500 DAC. It's treble tilting, it's kind of forward a little bit, where it can become a little fatiguing? No. The Dave gets out of the way, but it does depend on the amplifiers you put it on. It can go from excellent to outstanding. I've never heard it to be just good. It goes from excellent, outstanding, mind-boggling. What I think uh, really impressed me overall uh, for this Delta Sigma DAC is the timbre. Delta Sigma DACs don't have timbre the way uh, ladder DACs do, not in my experience. And this is the equivalent of an R2R DAC like the May in regards to timbre. Texture, I think, is better on the May. The central part of the information seems to be a bit more defined, a bit more touchable on the May KTE, but the edge of attack on the Dave is ridiculously good. These two DACs really do fight it out, and during the comparison review of all of these high-end DACs, we will break down each element. But I didn't want to review the Dave in isolation, I wanted there to be a form of coherency with other DACs. This beats the DAC-3B back there for stage, for timbre, for layering. It's, it's in a class of its own. So the caveat being, the stage doesn't shrink the way the May does. That annoys me a little bit for intimate tracks. Apart from that, I have no other gripes. I legitimately don't. So let's talk about equipment pairing. I alluded to the OR, the Serene, the Dave, and the LCD5 as one of the best systems I've heard, alongside the Dave and the Atrium, the Core TT2 and the M Scaler and the VC, and the Sasvara AHP2 and May, have been my top four or five systems of all time. Pretty much all of them costing well over $20,000, but it's to be expected. With the awe and the Serene as pre, not the Dave pre, you get even more of a black background. So it feels as though an artist is taking a black canvas using an illuminating white marker pencil and drawing each instrument's outline and each sonic characteristic outline for you. So it feels as though the elements are floating in the void of space. I have been blown away by the LCD5 on the Dave. It's such a good pairing. The atrium on the Dave has been such a mesmerizing experience. The lime ears, anima, 
a 3200 euro IEM has been amazing on the amplifier of the Dave itself. If you can afford this DAC, it's incredible. For the form factor, I don't think anything on the planet exists that rivals it. Look at the mains, absolutely huge. It can perform as well as this, and I think it's a little bit better at a third of the price when you add the M scaler that is obviously, because I think by itself, I think I would take the May. I legitimately would, for textual information, for the stage collapsing and expanding, I think I would take the May. But for portability in loose terms, the Dave is unrivaled. This is absolutely ridiculous. Look, this is ridiculous. And could have done this and achieved this in 2015. My hat off to you, gentlemen. This is just ridiculous. So, now let's talk about the internal amplifier of the Dave. I have heard a lot of comments saying the amplifier in the Dave is subpar. I disagree. I think you need to find the right synergy with the right headphone. The Dave amplifier can't drive planar headphones well. It doesn't have enough current for it. LCD5 is nice, on the ore as the amp for the Dave, it's freaking incredible. But for something like an atrium, which is easy to drive, 300 ohms, 96 dB sensitivity. I don't think I'll stop listening to that system. Just a pair of headphones, the Dave and a laptop. Using AudioQuest Carbon as the USB cable, I was happy as pig in pig squill, honestly. Sasvara on the Dave is a whole different story. That headphone requires a power amp. It just does. When we do the Sasvara re-review, I will break down why that's the case. But on the Dave, if you're listening up to about 55 to 60 dB, the tonality, the separation, the transparency from Sasvara has been some of the best I have ever heard. That includes the AHP2, the ore, and everything else as well. I, subjectively, it's the best experience I've had on Sasvara. You just can't turn it up because as soon as you go beyond 55, 60 dB, it starts breaking up. Like, it literally just distorting, like a toy, basically. And that's really disappointing, but it's to be expected. Sasvara sensitivities are 81 dB, sometimes in between 74 and 81 dB. It's never really accurately measured, so bear that in mind. This can't be your all-in-one solution for such headphones. Because the DAC in this exceeds the amp in this in magnitudes of volume. But it's good. It's good enough. It's good enough for an emergency. Definitely. And the tonal balance and transparency and stage, I think is better than the AHP2. It doesn't have the power and the technical skill to drive the low end of a Sasvara, but for that, it's that good. So let's talk about some of the caveats of this unit. Hardware is uh, questionable. Uh, whether you like it or not, it's up to you. I, I don't mind it. It's it, it looks weird. It just looks like nothing else I've had on the desk. So it, it's a hit and miss. I don't really care. Volume knob's nice. The interface is annoying as hell. Because for example, you can't choose um, pre or DAC mode by going through the menus. You have to hold these two buttons to actually activate that. There are some quirks in regards to the software, um, like the Mojo 2 you have to memorize, and you literally do have to actually read the manual for such things. I believe the remote is just, there aren't enough words in the English language to actually say what I feel about that remote for a $9,000 DAC. Th that's shameful, that, that, that's not a good thing. I would wish the amplifier in this unit was as good as, as the TT2, but maybe in the second generation. Um, the screen being this large, some people complain about. I don't, I think it's incredible for my situation because I can use OCR to read all the information on it. It outputs volume, filter, input, sample rate, and I can read it all with my iPhone, which has been a godsend to me. It's been wonderful, so yeah. Um, the fact that it's in a square, in a circle, it's a bit of a caveat. Why are you doing that? That's weird. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. It's weird. Optical is horrific. 
uh, on the Dave. I don't like it. Optical is horrific on everything. I am opposed to optical. I don't like it. It sounds plasticky and it sounds weird and it's got the same characteristic on everything I've tried from a TV all the way to a Dave. I, 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 I'm not a fan of optical. I don't care. I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't care for it. If you like it, it's fine. You're, you're, you've, you're entitled to be wrong. I don't like it. I hate the sound of optical, personally. It's just a no-no for me. And it takes a little while to switch between outputs and inputs and things like that. That is a bit irritating, but that's like the TT2, so it is what it is. Um, apart from that, honestly, this DAC is one of the most incredible DACs I've had on the desk, and I've had some incredible ones here as well. So, sonically, there's nothing to say but brilliant things. It's absolutely mesmerizing. But this will be compared to the May. This will be compared to the TT2 and the M scaler. This will be compared to the signature from IFI behind me. This will be compared to the DAC3B in upsampling mode and versus when that review drops. So if you are interested in all of these reviews, it's gonna be a five part series. Don't forget to subscribe and press a notification icon so you're alerted when it goes live. So we have to give a tiger score for this. Sonically, five tigers. Hardware, four tigers. Ergonomics and functionality, three tigers. I'm a bit uh, annoyed about the software, kind of the way it's laid out and stuff. It's simple, it's very straightforward. It's just a bit, why can't everything be grouped together? And uh, like the remote and... It's very functional, very, very functional, but um, I wish it was a little bit better. Give me a remote like this. That's what you call a remote. If you can't kill a whale with it, it's not a remote. So, the Chord Dave. Some of the most incredible DAC I have ever heard. You get four solid tigers. I am looking forward to the second generation of this. I don't think it's going to be too far long in the future. This is already seven years old. And it's still keeping up with some of the best in the industry. Well done, Cord. This review wasn't as in-depth as I wanted it to be, but it's already long enough. And other aspects of the DAC will be explored against other DACs in the May review and in the TT2 review. I can't stop gushing about this. I want to buy it. I don't think I can afford it. It's too expensive. <laughs> if you can, you're one of the lucky ones. And if you want these reviews, before anyone else, consider joining our Patreon, where early reviews drop before anywhere else. You get to jump into the private Telegram chat and see the unboxings and immediate response and what my feelings are towards these new equipment as they land. We get to discuss it for weeks before it gets released for review. The conversation in regards to synergy and pairing and stuff, everything you've heard in this review gets explored and you come along as I'm going through the thinking process and we go through the review process of these units. So if that's something you're intrigued by, consider joining. If not, consider joining our public Telegram chat. It's getting pretty damn big in there actually and it's always very active. And I drop in there as much as I can. Jez, you're a legend. Thank you for sending this in for review. It's very much appreciated. I'll see you next time. Peace.